Good morning to our colleagues um, here in DC and good afternoon to our friends and colleagues in Europe and around the world. My name is Jennifer Gordon and I'm the director of the Atlantic Council's Nuclear Energy Policy Initiative. And we're here today to have what I think will be a really fascinating conversation on how the United States can build nuclear energy independence and especially move away from Russian fuel supply. Um, but before we begin and before I introduce today's speakers, I just wanna thank my colleagues at the Eurasia Center. This program is co-hosted in partnership between the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and the Eurasia Center. And I especially wanna thank Ambassador John Herbst, Shelby Magid and Benton Koblenz for their thought leadership and for helping to put this together. So with that, we are so, so privileged um, to have with us today, His Excellency Herman Haloshenko, who is Minister of Energy from Ukraine. Minister, I'm delighted to turn this over to you. Thank you very much and uh, hello to everyone. I'm really glad to see you online. And if I don't see you anyway, I know that you are here and I know that you are with Ukraine. And and that is uh, my key message because really we can uh, discuss a lot of about the uh, nuclear and that is one of uh, one of the biggest topic I think uh, in, in, in our uh, energy agenda today. And uh, not only before, because of the war uh, between Ukraine and, and, and Russia, but I think it's had more have more wide uh, aspect, and and that is more the issue of uh, development of nuclear industry in the world. I'm absolutely sure, and I mentioned this many times in in many international forums and. Uh, EIA uh, the conference uh, that any small accident, even small accident on the Parisian NPP could stop the development of nuclear industry in the world, especially taking into account the COP28 uh, declaration concerning the tripling of nuclear uh, industry till 2050 as a main goal in, in our green transition goals. I think that is very important to to understand, and of course, uh, of course, that is a key topic uh, uh, in in the discussion. Um, we faced um, with the beginning of the full scale invasion. We really uh, faced some um, un unprecedented challenges uh, in uh, uh, in. Um, in Ukraine, especially when we are talking about the nuclear station. The first day of invasion, they occupied the Chernobyl NPP uh, from the night, uh, from set to force the Russian occupied the Zaporizhia NPP, which is the biggest nuclear station in Europe, uh, that is six units. And uh, unfortunately, the Zaporizhia NPP is still on the occupation. And so that will be, all, it will be almost two years uh, of of the occupation of this uh, of this station, and um, that's everything about the terrorism of Russia. So, if uh, you could see the uh, picture, how they occupied this Zaporizhia station. So they attacked this station by heavy heavy weapon. They uh, use tanks. They use artillery uh, to attack the station, and 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 that is something incredible. I mean, in civilized world. And that is what we discuss many, many, many times. But from other side, the Rosatom is still an uh, important player in the market uh, of nuclear fuel, uranium market. And that is also something what, what cannot be uh, uh, in real life. Because uh, after everything they did uh, with, with nuclear, and we are talking about nuclear safety and security. We are talking about seven pillars of nuclear safety and security, which they destroy completely. Uh, they are still a player. They still uh, uh, get money. Uh, they still increase their profits. And that is why we very strongly advocate the issue of sanctions against uh, Rosatom. Because, uh, you know, I have a lot of meetings uh, uh, two days ago, I, uh, in Kiev was Rafael Grossi, the EIA uh, head of EIA, and we discussed uh, with him uh, in details the situation in in the Parisian PP. So he is visited 
uh, yesterday the Zaporizhia MPP by himself. But uh, the problem is that uh, the situation becomes worse and worse. And, and it's only the question when, when the accident would happen. That is only a question when. Because degradation of equipment, the, the number of, of challenges uh, increase and problems increase. So we discussed that. Uh, now in other issues, that is our personnel, Ukrainian personnel, is not allowed it to, to work at the station from the 1st of February. And they have the lack of uh, qualified persons, personnel there. And, and that is also influenced dramatically the equipment. It, it's influenced the situation. And we already fixed a number of leakages uh, at the station. So we raise the issue of nuclear fuel because the term of uh, operation of nuclear fuel is over and what to do so it's still uh, in six reactors because it's it's not only westinghouse fuel but that is also russian fuel uh, the 12 fuel but what what to do with this fuel should we extract them uh, for, uh, and who will do this i mean at least there is no qualified personnel but all this question i can uh, speak a lot of, about these problems which which we have and, and these risks uh, which are on the table. But all of these supervised by Rosatom uh, Rosatom staff. So the Rosatom representative they are on the station. They in fact uh, operate the station. They uh, made a lot of decisions uh, uh, which uh, dramatically influence the nuclear safety and security on the site. And that's why coming coming back to what I mentioned, that uh, it can't be the case when Rosatom is still a player uh, in not only European markets. So we know that, that uh, they also supply uranium for United States companies. And that is what we discussed, that it's very important uh, to make a steps uh, to get rid of Russians uh, on nuclear market. And I'm very glad that a lot of steps, which is already did, we did together with the United States uh, company. And uh, I can just give you uh, several examples of, uh, I think, great success and geopolitical success uh, of uh, our cooperation. Uh, one of uh, these uh, example is a new fuel uh, for VPR 440 reactors, which uh, was produced only by Rosatom uh, before September uh, last year. And we did a great job. I'm very grateful to our partners, Westinghouse, and uh, they really uh, created a huge team of engineers, experts. We sent our experts, uh, which also worked together, and we did this, uh, this type of fuel, which destroyed the monopoly of Russia in, in this market. And this fuel is already loaded in one of our nuclear station. It's operational. And uh, now uh, the at least five countries in Europe, which have no possibility to buy elsewhere only by Russia, this fuel now get this possibility. And I know that the contracts, a lot of contracts is already signed. And that is a great example. So we did a very important step just to open the gate for for sanctions because I also understand that it's quite difficult for many countries and my friends and and colleagues the ministers of energy they mentioned to me that we are understand we want to support the sanctions but we have no choice we we cannot buy a fuel for we are 440 somewhere except Russia so we destroyed this so now we open the gate for discussion concerning the sanctions. Of course, we uh, uh, we construct the storage of wasted nuclear fuel in Ukraine. We did it during the war. Uh, it's already operational. So we already uh, sent our wasted nuclear fuel to this storage. And it's allowed us to operate nuclear fleet. I can tell you that this winter, our system is quite stable. So we, uh, we are almost at the end of the winter, but there is no restriction uh, of the electricity supply and all nine uh, nuclear units which are on Ukrainian controlled territory uh, is on operation during all the winter. And it's also helped these storages. It's really helped us 
uh, to survive, I mean, to be frank, to survive in this, in this uh, energy war. And this uh, storage was built together with American company Holtec. So, and, and I mean, we did it. And that is a concrete case, the concrete success of cooperation between United States and Ukraine. Another case that is our plans, and our plans is to build a P1000 units in Ukraine. And I am 100% sure that we will do this. So we already uh, signed a contract with Westinghouse for the first part of equipment. Uh, we already agreed about this last at the end of, of uh, last year. So we, I think that that is a great time to increase the influence of United States uh, nuclear industry in Europe. Uh, I'm not only, so we're talking, of course, we know that there is also a, a contracts with good cooperation with Poland, with Romania, with Bulgaria. And I really very happy that that is a moment to substitute Russian technologies in Europe. And, and that is much wider issue that only cooperation between Ukraine. But I'm also, uh, between Ukraine and United States, but I'm also sure that together, I mean, the case of, of uh, construction of new type of fuel, that is our common case, that is our common achievement. So we together will be more stronger uh, if we will cooperate in, 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 in nuclear fuel, and then we we will push Russians off. A lot of uh, things is still discussed about uranium, and of course, unfortunately, they still have the influence on, on this market, And but that is also a question of time. That is also a question of time, and we, we had uh, also, I, I welcome the uh, enrichment, the, the money in the US budget for uh, enrichment program uh, uh, this year, uh, we had the, also cooperation with Canada, with uh, UK, uh, concerning the increase in production. So that is only a question when the, uh, let's say, the Russian role in uranium market would be decreased, not to allow them to manipulate at least prices or to influence the market. And I think that's very important that uh, we are on this way. We're already on this way, and I almost feel that... Uh, this year, we could achieve a lot of in, in, in uh, increasing the production and decreasing the Russian role in, in, in this market. And that is very important case because, uh, again, we are talking about the sanction. You know, I, I, I very often ask, and, and Rafael was here, uh, I mentioned already Grossi, and he was also asked, so he, he was in Kyiv, then he come to the Parisia, then he, he, next week he will be in Moscow to discuss with Putin uh, everything, uh, what is happening on the Parisian MPP. And he was asked a very good question, Rafael, what you will do if Russians don't care? And I know that they don't care. I mean, we have so many resolutions of the Board of Governors of EIA, uh, General Conference, so they don't care. They don't care about international law, about any, any international instruments. So what you will do, because that is the issue of uh, safety, nuclear safety and security. And I just, just uh, besides the issues I mentioned concerning the equipment and fuel, uh, the Zaporizhian PP was eight times in blackout, eight times. So we, we, we were almost one step uh, before the Fukushima scenario here, eight times. Uh, and he said that we will try to convince Russia. And... I mean, from his from his position, he's right. He he should convince, he try to insist and ask them to follow uh, resolution to follow international rules. But in our case, in our field, and absolutely, uh, I am absolutely sure that that is right. If the the other side don't hear, you, don't wants to 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 speak in the rules or to live in the rules, the one answer from your side, from civilized side, that is a punishment. And the punishment is the sanctions. No other way. If we cannot do the, the sanctions right now, let's say this year, or to provide the sanctions immediately, uh, we could adopt it, we should adopt it now, and say that they will enter into force next year, two years. I don't know. I, I'm, I don't want to, to make some timeline for that. But I think it's very important time now, uh, at least to adopt these sanctions, to adopt these sanctions and to show 
the signal to the market, to show the signal to the world that the Russians would not be a part of civilized market in nuclear. I think that is very important. And uh, therefore, uh, it's very important that U.S. Congress, I know that there is a discussion uh, the, about the law and sanctions and some gradual sanctions for Russian nuclear. That's why it's very important. So I, when I when I was in, in D.C., I had a lot of meetings at the Hill with, with many, many, uh, um, many uh, representatives of the Congress, and, and, and I address this. And it's very important to pass the sanctions now, just to choose this gradual how, how, mu how many times it will take. But we have to say now to them, guys, no, you will never be in the uh, market in the civilized market after everything you did uh, with the nuclear uh, safety and security in Ukraine. So that is my my message, and uh, thank you very much once again for uh, opportunity to speak. Very glad uh, glad uh, to be here. Mr. Haluchenko, thank you so so much. Um, it's such an honor to have you here with us. And I really am looking forward to this conversation and to getting into a number of the issues that you raised, um, specifically the notion that I think we all agree with that Russian is Russia is very much um, an unreliable partner, um, looking at global dependence on Rosatom, and of course this question addressing the question or the notion of of sanctions. Um, and so with us today to get into all of these issues, we have an excellent panel, and I'm delighted to introduce Deborah Kagan, who is Senior Advisor to the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, John Kotek, Senior Vice President of Policy Development and Public Affairs at the Nuclear Energy Institute, Sean Albert, Vice President for Corporate Business Strategy at Centris Energy Corporation, and Olena Pavlenko, who is the President of Dixie Group. Olena, I'd like to start with you. Talk to us a little bit more about how Rosatom is involved with other parts of Russian industry and how Rosatom contributes to the Russian economy. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak today and uh, contribute to the discussion. I think I will um, add to what the minister said that if uh, the, the, the another part, actually Russia, is not only um, does not only take care of what uh, what uh, we ask them. They actually mis are misleading all the world using the uh, nuclear sector as a possibility to avoid or bypass sanctions. So the strategy of Russia is now, because uh, nuclear is not sanctioned now, um, the, the, the Rosatom is, becomes a structure which widening its types of activities. And it goes to those sectors and subsectors which are under the sanctions. Uh, and especially if we talk about microchips, electronics, everything which uh, used for the uh, weapons, uh, for the tanks to continue a war in Ukraine, everywhere. So uh, what we see now that during the last year, Rosatom and its uh, companies, for example, Critical Information Systems Company, they bought several Russian companies which are working with uh, microchips and electronics. So. If those companies are sanctioned, uh, critical information system, Rosatom, they still have a possibility to deal with electronics and mi microchips. And they still have a possibility to supply their industry to produce more weapons. And uh, moreover, I would say that the um, nuclear sector and Rosatom and its companies also started to go uh, internationally. Uh, they recently um, bought, I think, my, almost bought the South Korean company which produce lithium batteries and uh, the same question the lithium also is used uh, to supply uh, and to 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 to, to produce a weapon for um, to continue the war um the same rosatom closed in deal uh, in uh, i think it was last year as well uh, to uh, to buy the 50% of the electronics manufacturer craftway and they um, import microcontrollers, transistors, microchips from China, Taiwan, South Korea. So uh, my question is, if we keep nuclear sector without sanctions, we actually make the other sectors and all the sanction policy leaky and ineffective. We just create loopholes for Russia 
to go forward and just ignore all the sanctions policy. So it is a possibility and it is really a huge need now to sit down and think what and how we can do in order to sanction nuclear uh, nuclear sector in Russia. Thanks a lot. Elena, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for, I think, impressing upon us just the gravity of the situation. Um, I'd like to turn to the US nuclear energy industry. John, give us a bit of a status update of the industry in the United States. What is our industry's need for fuel and to what extent are we dependent on Russian fuel supply? Yeah, thanks Jennifer and thanks for having me. Uh, so the need for fuel here in the US is only gonna grow. What What's happened over the last handful of years is that uh, utilities have come to recognize the really valuable role that nuclear energy plays in meeting their both need to produce electricity, but also to, to meet their decarbonization commitments. As a result, we've seen uh, utilities announce that for just about every operating reactor here in the U.S., they're going to pursue what they call subsequent license drill, which is taking the plant operation out to 80 years. So we expect to see current plants operating for decades to come. We're also seeing more and more utilities, including nuclear, in their future planning. So in their integrated resource plans, uh, for example, in the utility sector, uh, we did a survey of NEI members, for example, and, and found that they expect to see nuclear generation just in their fleets roughly double uh, by the 2050s. Our utilities represent a little less than half the electric generation in the U.S., so it gives you a sense that you, you could be seeing a doubling, a tripling of nuclear generation here in the United States uh, in the coming decades. We're also seeing a lot more interest in nuclear from non-traditional customers. So think the you know the oil, gas, chemical sectors, uh, you know maybe big data, uh, other companies that are committed to decarbonization and recognize the value of having that firm, clean uh, generation that nuclear energy provides. So we're, we're going to need a lot more fuel at the moment. Uh, you, you see Russia as a supplier of, you know, uranium is on the order of about 10%. We get uranium from a lot of different places. Um, where where it comes to, becomes an issue is in the, the steps along the way from turning that uranium into nuclear fuel. And so there are a couple of stages called uranium conversion, and then uranium enrichment that we'll get into. There you're talking more on the order of, you know, the 20 to 25% range of those services coming from from Russia. Uh, certainly there are uh, facilities in the US, Europe, other places that can provide those services. But uh, at the moment, that's constrained globally, and we're going to need to fix that. John, thank you so much. And I think this is a perfect segue um, to go to Sean, because Sean, your company, Centris, has been at the center of efforts to build United States enrichment capacity, especially for high assay, low enriched uranium or HALU. So could you tell us a bit more about your work and the steps that Centris is taking to establish domestic supply? Sure, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and, and, and thanks um, to the other panelists, appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, so um, we here at Centris, um, we are looking to address um, the, the some of the some of the supply challenges that um, the minister uh, mentioned and that uh, John just discussed. Um, we're right now um, focusing in on HALU, um, high assay LEU, which is the fuel that's going to be needed by many of the next generation of advanced reactors. Um, at Centris, we just commenced uranium operations at our um, uranium enrichment facility in Piketon, Ohio. We started in October of last year um, in partnership with the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, we have met the first phase of that contract, and we are now moving into phase two of that contract, which will require us to produce just under one metric ton of this new, um, um, this new fuel that's going to be needed by the advanced reactors. Um, as, as significant as the commencement of operations is for the advanced reactor community, it is also worth noting that um, the commencement of operations at our site constitutes the first new enrichment facility in the United States to use new US, tech, US technology to begin operations in 70 years. So this is kind of a big deal, and it actually gets to a lot of the issues that we've already discussed about how do we address the some of the choke points that we face 
um, in the enrichment market. Um, this is the first step in addressing that. Um, in addition to working with our partners at the Department of Energy, we're working with um, industry um, advanced, reactor, advanced reactor developers. We have MOUs in place with TerraPower and Oklo to um, put in place the enrichment capacity that they are going to need. And what we're looking to do and what we're capable of doing, getting to the point that we discussed earlier, is we can actually ramp up production as this demand grows pretty quickly. But it gets to the broader point that we face in the enrichment market in general, and that's worth noting across the market, which is that it actually takes time to put in place the capacity that's going to be needed to replace what I think everybody agrees and that the Biden administration agrees with its policy of winding down our reliance on Russian materials so that we're never in this position again. This is a years long capital intensive effort, whether it be for high assay LAU or to address the much larger market of low enriched uranium. We're exploring opportunities at Centris to address that market. The legislation that's up on the Hill that the minister re referenced earlier that would um, appropriate billions of dollars to the Department of Energy to help incentivize this um, investment is sorely needed. Um, we'll have to see whether or not that legislation gets passed through Congress and actually gets appropriated. But the opportunity right now, both to address the emerging HALU needs, as well as what we see in the LEU market is there, but we, we are gonna need to take action to move forward with this. Sean, thank you so much. And as we talk about winding down dependence on Russia, Deborah, I want to go to you because you and I have talked a lot about the role of sanctions, the appropriateness of sanctions. Um, share some of your thoughts with us, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to my colleagues at the Eurasia Center for putting this very important panel together. And it's extremely timely, and I really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to say, uh, I want to start on a couple of things. The the first thing, which will probably make me wildly unpopular in some sections, is that for a very long time, the United States made decisions on its production of enriched uranium based on people who were more involved with nonproliferation than with the need for energy uh, to power our country. And as a result, we are behind the curve. And uh, this is what happens when you allow one section of this U.S. government to make decisions for everything else without looking at the geostrategic implications. So I said that will probably make me wildly unpopular, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's true. Um, the second thing is that I want to say is that there is no doubt that Russia's track record on safety and security is abysmal. There's no doubt that across Russia's entire energy sector, the, one, the world's largest producer of methane, um, everyone knows this about Russia. And I would be the first person to go after Russia hard with sanctions if I thought it was the pragmatic and correct approach to take. Unfortunately, because of what all of my colleagues have said here today, we are not in a position yet to continue to have nuclear security and safety and energy security in this country without continuing to import Russian enriched uranium product, UH6, et cetera, of, of what we need to, to move forward with um, nuclear energy in this country. And I'm gonna say this, even though we're not gonna get into this today, it is critical if you're gonna address climate change to have nuclear be a huge part of that solution. And I think people who don't want to talk about that are missing the point because we're not going to achieve those goals any other way. Um, and so, uh, and, and then lastly, because again, I am very pragmatic on this, um, I would be the first one to line up to smack Russia down if there was any reasonable way to do this without then uh, making Russia either more money or turning them into new markets. And so, one of the biggest issues for sanctions is um, is being very careful here that uh, we don't e that we don't even look at carve outs because Rosatom can simply say, okay, we're going to cut these contracts, we're going to go to the uh, Indo Pacific, and we're going to make one hundred fifty five dollars a swoo instead of the 
the lousy $50 that I'm being paid now by the United States contracts. So for right now, uh, pragmatism, I think, rules ideology. Deborah, thank you so much. And um, popularity or not, um, as always, I think we appreciate your, your pragmatism. Um, Elena, I want to go back to you uh, because you mentioned and before you spoke about um, Rosatom's involvement in production of, of weapons. And so what are some of your thoughts on the ways in which Rosatom invo Rosatom's involvement in other parts of Russian industry could be addressed? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, if I may, I will just briefly also comment on, on the, the Greeks from the panel. Um, two small points. One is uh, uh, the situation now in nuclear reminds me a bit of the situation in gas a few years ago. Um, in particular, uh, you remember uh, we all uh, had had this discussion between uh, with Europe um, that we should not, uh, you know, have any fights with Russia because uh, where Europe de was dependent, especially Germany was dependent on Russian gas. And um, everyone wanted to, to to be pragmatic and still have a possibility to keep uh, more or less uh, balance um, economic policy. But uh, when it came to the 2021, um, it was Russia who decided um, to decrease gas supply to Europe. And then it was Russia who decided to play with Nord Stream 2 with uh, um, all these geopolitical gas games. So my, my point would be that uh, I don't think we should wait for the critical situation which might happen, uh, this critical situation it is now. And Russia can decide to stop supply uh, enriched uranium to any country uh, when it is decides. And uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a threat which should be taken into account already now. And the second point is that, um, um, yes, uh, geopolitics, pragmatism is really, that's important, but isn't it a pragmatic to think what will happen in 10 years, in 15 years, when Russia will build uh, 10, 15 nuclear power plants in uh, different parts of the world, in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, South Africa, Brazil. And then there will be a very similar situation which Ukraine has now with the Parisian nuclear power plant, when um, there is actually a constant threat uh, uh, that something will happen at the nuclear power plant. And in that case, uh, where countries will be dependent from, from Russian nuclear fuel, uh, there will be also economic dependency because uh, every day Russia can say, we will not produce electricity to you uh, or something else can happen. So I think if we think not about five years, seven years, but uh, further and not about the particular Western countries, but the other countries in the world where Russia and Rosatom already are trying to operate, um, this would be very pragmatic to, to think how to stop them. And now let me let me move to the how to stop them. I think okay. uh, I, I, I share the position that it's it's uh, it might be too dangerous for many countries just to cut all the deals now. But um, there are still possibilities to uh, think how to sanction those who want to work with Rosatom from now and to the future in the in the future. Um, or want to buy something from Rosatom, or Rosatom would like to buy something uh, from now and in the future. We still have, have a possibility to sanction research institutions who are working under the Rosatom and uh, have access to the new technologies like small modular reactors, uh, work with uh, IAEA on, on different new research projects, because in the future they also can, be, can use this as a weapon um, or dependence, the technology which will create dependency of other countries. So I think there are uh, other possibilities to sanction nuclear sector, uh, even if uh, if there is no will or possibility to sanction Rosatom direct. Thanks a lot. Elena, thank you so much. And thank you for taking us with that look into the future. Um, I also think it's important to look at the past and understand how we got to the situation that we're in. Um, so, John, can you give us a little bit of context and background on why is it that we're here talking about rebuilding U.S. enrichment capacity? What what happened to to bring us to this point? Yeah, uh, certainly, and I and and I can start, and I'm I'm sure Deborah and Sean can comment on this as well. And I, Deborah, I think part of, at least of the the policy uh, decision making you were referring to earlier might have been the megatons to megawatts 
uh, project going back to you know 1993 all the way through 2013, where you know, it was U.S. government policy where we wanted utilities in the U.S. to purchase uranium from Russia because it was you know giving a uh, it was a place to go with uh, uranium from uh, warheads that had been dismantled and, and blended down, and so you know 20 years of commercial relationship. Uh, promoted by U.S. government policy, led to some strong, you know, uh, commercial relationships that that have extended uh, to the the current day. Um, I I will say on the on the uh, question about you know, sort of how we go forward, the commercial industry in the U.S. has voluntarily committed to end reliance on uh, Russian fuel uh, enrichment and conversion services, but the it, you, as has been again alluded to earlier, you need. If you're going to step away from that, you need something to step two. And so what we need to see is we need to see the necessary investment and the demand signals to help ensure that that uh, capacity is is actually built out and available. And so that's why you know we're we're strongly supportive of the actions that the Biden administration and and Congress have proposed to uh, make investments in both low enriched uranium and uh, high assay LEU fuel availability. Uh, we were certainly appreciative of Congress passing the Nuclear Fuel Security Act as part of the, the NDAA. Now we need to see that program funded. Uh, and we're optimistic that, you know, certainly we, we've seen it in admis- uh, requesting the administration and inclusion of, of funding in, uh, in uh, legislative vehicles on the, on the Hill. Uh, I think that's the sort of thing that's going to draw the private sector investment that we need to see here in the U.S. to actually build out the capabilities that are necessary to move away from Russian supply. John, thank you so much. And again, I think this segues perfectly um, into into the question that I have, Sean, for you. Um, We are approaching what I think and hope will be a deployment decade for the next generation of nuclear reactors. And many of those, as we know, will use HALU. So what does the domestic nuclear fuel industry need to be doing and what do they they need in terms of policy or in terms of funding um, in order to bring enrichment capabilities to where they have to be to meet that increased demand? Sure. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, Consistent with some of the comments from Elena and John, um, you know, Elena hits hits the point, I think, exactly right, which is that the whole issue that we're talking about right now in terms of enrichment and, and global supply chains and, and, and the like, um, this is a geostrategic issue. Um, and the commitments that many of our partner countries and governments have made coming out of COP28 and the commitment that some of the G7 countries made surrounding um, investment in enrichment capacity reflect the fact that the governments understand that this um, particular sector in particular is a geostrategic issue and requires geostrategic thought and solutions to that. Um, To piggyback on the point that I made earlier, we need, um, and like John said, we need investment and we need demand signals. Um, the enrichment game, it, like I said earlier, is a very capital intensive um, game. Um, the These plants cost in the billions, not in the millions, and they take a long time and a lot of infrastructure to put in place. Um, unlike other, some of the other energy markets, um, the enrichment market is dominated by essentially four suppliers. Um, Russia, China, Orono, and Urenco. And each of those suppliers had their plants 100% paid for by their governments. It reflects the fact that these governments understand that this is a geostrategic issue, just like our government is understanding now the same. We're going to require a public-private partnership in order to address this issue. Um, in, and, and wean ourselves off this reliance that we've been discussing during this conversation. And in the HALU um, example in the advanced reactor market, it's exactly the same. Um, as many of you know, um, the market has been facing what is commonly referred to as the chicken and the egg problem. What's going to come first? The advanced reactors who need the fuel to demonstrate the reactors or the enrichment capacity 
that is going to supply the fuel. Well, the enrichers and companies like myself are not going to put and build capacity if there's not an order book of suppliers. So what's going to come first? Um, as many of you know, the Department of Energy and the U.S. Congress are working together on this. Um, and this is where the DOE HALO availability program is so crucial. Um, there's an opportunity right now um, for a half a billion dollars to help kickstart investment in this capacity to help address what we all agree is we need to get this capacity up and running so that these reactive developers can demonstrate their technologies and start selling them in a way to piggyback on what Elena said and the geostrategic theme. We want to make sure that when these companies are selling their reactors around the world, that they're buying them from reliable partners, like-minded partners, and have a fuel cycle, a whole fuel cycle that they can rely on rather than the situation that we exist in right now. Sean, thanks. And I really appreciate you, well, all the points that you made, but especially um, the idea that we really need to find a way, whether probably through public-private partnerships, but finding a way to compete against state-owned enterprises um, on the global market. So thank you. And Deborah, I wanna go back um, to, to the pragmatic um, arguments that you made before around sanctions. Um, if sanctions, if you view sanctions as an ineffective tool um, to, to push Rosatom, um, what are some alternative ways to put pressure on, on Russia and Rosatom? Well, uh, first of all, um, I, thank you very much. And, and I appreciate all the other comments. And I wanted to just a quick two finger on Elena's point. I'm, I'm in violent agreement with you on everything you said. The reason why we could push so hard, though, to cut off Russian gas is because the U.S. had lots of LNG and it was a ready thing and it, all it meant was exporting it. And that's what was done. So it, it's it's it there was an alternative. And uh, so so Europe could continue heating their homes and running their industries. Um, this is not the case here. Um, I just wanted to bring out one point here. I think the EU gets a third of all of their enrichment capacity from Russia. Uh, and someone can correct me, but I believe that's accurate as of last year's numbers. Um, and I also want to bring up one other point on the pragmatic point is even with sanctions, um, Russia earns over $200 billion annually from fossil fuel exports and related fossil fuel products, and only $20 billion annually from its enrichment services and that, that whole train of things. So uh, there is this point of how much would this really affect Rosatom economically? The value of sanctions is and what they can do to stop someone from behaving badly or cut them off financially so they cannot perform. And I think that in the GDP aspects of the Russian economy, that's not a huge amount. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, the, the other thing I think that can be done is to have Congress and whatever administration is gonna be in power to continue plussing this up and having these private uh, public partnerships as, as Sean referred to. Um, there is no alternative. The US has to build a huge amount of indigenous capacity here to go for it. There's not an alternative. And I think I've heard people say that this could be five years in coming, but the way this changes is by building the capacity and then changes the economy of scale. So for example, um, companies might be more inclined to build more small nuclear reactors if um, the price for running those was equal to or lower than using um, LNG, for example. So it's an, it's an economy of scale. So you have to convince, I mean, recently New Scale had canceled this product, I believe it was in Idaho. And they canceled it because it was just cheaper mm -hmm. to use to run this. So the plus up has to be pretty significant so that not only are we building indigenous capacity for existing and some new reactors, but that we're building an economy that has more nuclear writ large and where the price for utilities of running those systems is equal to or less than 
what they're currently paying for LNG. And so that's how I see this going forward, but I don't think there is a magic way to make this happen in a year or two. And so what you will need is a consistent, long-term commitment to ensuring that this goes forward. And frankly, it's a little bit dishonest on our part to uh, not push this if we're serious about um, uh, green energy. Jennifer, thank you. Um, we are almost at the end of our time, but I do have one question remaining um, for each of you, but perhaps we can sort of take this next round as a lightning round. Um, Olena, there are stakeholders in Ukraine who, some stakeholders who are questioning Ukraine's transition to US designed nuclear reactors. So tell us um, in your opinion, why is this the case? And uh, to go back to this forward looking or future looking um, idea, what do you see as the long-term future for Ukraine's nuclear energy industry? Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I don't know those people who say that uh, uh, there shouldn't be cooperation with the US uh, uh, in nuclear. At least those people are not public uh, because uh, Ukraine has a really, really bad experience with being dependent in energy sector. And now with that experience, we are running around the world and, and saying, please, please diversify. Don't be dependent from Russia. That's what I'm saying also today. And uh, I think uh, this is a great uh, also lessons learned for Ukraine. And uh, what we do have uh, in our uh, energy security strategy, national energy and climate plan, which is developing now, um, energy strategy till 2050, uh, all of these strategies are saying that we have to build a uh, diversified uh, energy sector and we have to be as independent in all elements, including in nuclear sector as possible. And we have to move away from Russia, definitely. We cannot be dependent on anything from Russia. And we have to work with the US and other partners to build strong nuclear sector in Ukraine. Um, we do have a great experience, again, to move away from Russian fuel using the US fuel. And uh, I think it's a great experience. And, and uh, yes, it's a great experience which other e European countries can use. Um, and uh, it's our task now, I believe also uh, Ukraine's task now to work with uh, uh, European countries to increase sanctions first, but second also to develop uh, this e internal capacity and, and uh, possibility uh, to develop uh, independent, uh, diversified, uh, nuclear sector by ourselves. In the future, I think Ukraine, with its experience, with the quite a huge nuclear share, will will continue being a quite significant nuclear country. And I really, really appreciate uh, further cooperation, uh, especially on new technologies like SMRs with Ukraine. And I be do believe that we can be a really knowledge hub uh, for Eastern Europe or for Europe uh, in nuclear sector. I wish we could be there like this. Thanks a lot. Elena, thank you so much um, for those insights. And John, I'd like to turn to you. We've talked about the increased demand and what we project will be the increasing demand for nuclear energy and the commensurate increased demand for fuel. Tell us a little bit about what the next decade, um, or just briefly what the next decade looks like um, for the US nuclear energy industry. Yeah, so uh, lightning round. I think you're going to start. Right. You're going to start seeing a lot more reactors uh, enter construction, both in the, the U.S., Canada, but but around the world. Uh, and don't know exactly what those you know, what those reactor types are going to be. Frankly, I think it'll be a variety, but uh, they're all going to need fuel. And you know, coming on the heels of things like the Sapporo Five commitment to invest north of four billion dollars in fuel supply. I think if, if the US government in particular can make good on its commitment and, and on the legislation that's currently uh, under consideration, I think you're gonna see a pretty significant build out of uh, conversion and enrichment capacity to go along with, uh, to help fuel all these new plants. John, thank you. Sean, at the end of last year, Centris had this big breakthrough that you mentioned. What's next on the horizon for Centris? Sure. Uh, thanks. So we're looking to obviously to um, continue with that momentum and expand our capacity at our at, at our Piketon, Ohio site. Um, 
the, in the next phase of our contract with the Department of Energy, we're going to be supplying just under a metric ton of um, high assay LEU. So we're looking to execute on that. Um, as we move forward and consistent with what I said earlier about the need for a public-private partnership, the next year is really going to be key. In our conversations with our industry partners and the conversations up on the Hill, um, you know, John hit the nail on the head. They're all going to need fuel. And that need for fuel right now is ever present. Um, you know, Centris is a different company than the rest of the enrichers around the world. We are not state backed. We are not state owned. We are a privately held company. But it is simply unrealistic. And, you know, Deborah hit the point earlier. It's unrealistic to assume that we're going to address this geostrategic challenge purely through a commercial and market mechanism. It's going to require a public private partnership. Luckily, there is a bipartisan support up on the Hill, Republicans and Democrats. Everybody understands this. And if we're able to get this progress in this next year going forward, then I really, truly do think we're going to be able to achieve some of these real successes with reactor demonstrations, reactor constructions. And then the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, Centris is unique in a couple of different ways. Right now, we are the only NRC licensed facility in the world that can make the high assay LAU. The only other supplier right now that's commercial out there is Russia. And so we are uniquely positioned to help intersect that demand for HALU both in the United States and around the world. And then the second thing that I would note is, you know, the U.S. government has a need for enriched uranium for its own purposes, for own government demands. And because our technology is a U.S. technology, we're going to be working with our partners in government to help intersect that timeline, which is coming at some point to help get them their enriched uranium that they're gonna need for their own government purposes. Sean, thank you. And Deborah, leave us with your thoughts on the geopolitical context. What's next over the next several years? Oh, well, thank you for uh, giving me a very wide opening there. I, I wanted to, to say this, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. There is a wealth of technological know-how of uh, nuclear enrichment, of nuclear safety and security in Ukraine. There is an immense number of talented people. There is storage facilities. There is a, a, the, the makings of a huge partnership between Ukraine and the United States and other Western groups to uh, push this forward to make this happen faster. So the best way to do this is give Ukraine what it needs to win this war now so it can then move forward as a partner of just not worrying how it's going to deliver energy to its own people, but how it can help deliver energy to the rest of the like-minded countries in this world who want to move forward together in a partnership. So thank you for giving me that opening uh, to say this. Well, thank you. And I think, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Um, but I want to say a special thanks to friends and colleagues in Ukraine. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and to our audience. And again, a special thanks to the Eurasia Center. Stay safe, everyone, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot.